The beauty and peace of San Antonio's river and creeks can turn to something else when the rain comes. Every other block, it's flooding. Most locals remember the flood of 98, the floods of the 70s, some of the 50s and 60s. People were still dying every year and uh, the neighborhood would be, would be cut off by the uh, high water. But there's a less known disaster from 100 years ago. They talked about a monster entering San Antonio and nothing could stop this monster. The choices that followed. It is, to my mind at least, the single most important event that happened in the city. Reveal the impact of decisions by local leaders and the power of everyday San Antonians. On the sixth floor of San Antonio's Central Library rest pages and photos depicting the flood of 1921. There are familiar landmarks of today, surrounded by water that swept around 2,000 people into the streets. People almost entirely uh, of Spanish surname who, who died, uh, swept away in the middle of that night in September 9-10. Char Miller, author of the book West Side Rising, unearthed pages of names, paying tribute to those who perished. Some now buried, not all marked, at San Fernando Cemetery 1. They were swept into raging waters that came as the river and creeks rose. It was a time before the Olmos Dam, Riverwalk, or San Antonio River Authority played a role in control. The storm hit the whole city, but Miller's research shows West Side neighborhoods took a really hard hit. People are coming in from Mexico and they're building houses with not much money. So they're all, instead of on this concrete walkway that we're doing, mm -hmm. you, you've got little casitas all over the place. There were houses here. Houses, houses all around. Those houses were destroyed and a large number of what Miller says were likely more than 80 deaths came from the west side. Graciela Sanchez of the Esperanza Peace and Justice Center, who grew up near this creek, says even decades later, not enough was done. And with torrential downpours came more flooding and more loss. It was everybody. It was animals, it was, it was little babies, it was adults, it was elders, just everybody was so vulnerable. Much of the post-storm response was focused on downtown. The city built the Olmos Dam to protect buildings and preserve business. The logic was economic. We need to do the things that are going to save the downtown buildings, right? and where the poor people live, not so much. It took grassroots action to start getting results. Residents organized communities organized for public service, known as COPS, to petition for infrastructure improvements. Their advocacy made waves and they pushed for the election of Hispanic and neighborhood leaders to office. As a U.S. representative, Henry B. Gonzalez championed federal funding for flood control and housing. As mayor, Henry Cisneros worked to fix problems he'd seen firsthand. I grew up on the west side in a neighborhood called Prospect Hill. Hill because it's a little higher. But down beneath us, literally three, four blocks from my house, when I was growing up, people died pretty much every spring when the Apache Creek was exceeded its bounds and people were drowned and houses were washed away. Uh, so. San Antonio waited a long time before it did the right and fair thing, and that is act on all the parts of the problems. Three. Three. In 2010, Mayor Julian Castro celebrated the opening of the first linear creekway on the west side. Today, overflowing creeks don't take lives like they did, though some say there's still work to do. The inner city is taken care of through all these great drainage ditches that cops and everybody work for, so that's a great part but there's still some lacking areas that are being missed by the city. Ben Acovio has lived near Park and Brazos off and on for 66 years. Whenever it rains, he says, the street floods. Our concern for our neighborhood is the drainage for the kids so the kids can get to school. There's also a call for more projects that balance beautification with not lifting land costs above the reach of residents. Covio says much of the answer can be found in the voices of neighbors. So rather than react, let's be proactive in everything that we do. We asked the voters to come out and vote. They did. Okay. We have good city council people in there. 
Now let's make them work for the election that we got. Councilwoman Terry Castillo represents District 5 on the west side. So one, we already know due to redlining that this is the most economically poor area of the city. Um, but in addition to that, it's some of the city's oldest housing stock. So by failing to address the drainage and flooding issues, we're allowing for the continuation of the deterioration. She's encouraging her constituents to speak up so changes can be made to budgets and on bond issues while preserving current housing costs. So when we talk about environmental justice, we need to ensure that we're prioritizing and centering people. We shouldn't be left, you know, as secondary citizens. And, and yet in 2021, 100 years after this flood of 1921, we still live si in, in very similar conditions and with many, many of the same problems. Some say we can use the past to prepare for the future. Lives lost that led to change. As we discuss flooding, we're only going to experience more extreme weather conditions. And how can we as a city, as a county, minimize those impacts by being intentional today? There will be other things. Heat. If we go through additional climate change and global warming, what do we need to be doing to protect people related to the heat? We've done an enormous amount to protect ourselves. But we owe an incredible debt of thanks to those um, who frequently perished on the west side, not just in 21 flood, but in many subsequent ones. So the sights and sounds of San Antonio's west side today can be strong and vibrant, holding echoes of the homes and life once swept away. With photojournalist Alex Castillo, Eric Zuko, Ken's 5 Eyewitness News.